On the phone, we have a gentleman who played in the NFL for the Houston Oilers. He also played at Jackson State for college with a guy who played here in Chicago, wasn't too shabby, by the name of Walter Payton, a guy who should be in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Why he's not in it, I don't get it. Robert Brazil. Robert, I see that you grew up in Alabama. How did you end up going to Jackson State, not Alabama? Well, everybody uh, during the time when I come out of high school, which is back in the uh, 70s, I had a, originally signed with Troy State. Troy State is one of the major colleges here. I had a roommate which was named Ricky Young, a very good friend of mine, and we grew up together and we wanted to go to college. So we took a bus trip up to Troy State for a visit, and we signed a letter of intent with Troy State. We thought we was going to end up playing there, but my mom and my dad wanted to see the college where we what we had chosen. Went up, we went up during the, the wrong time of the year. It was springtime. And you can think about springtime here in Alabama. All the people was out sun tanning. And my mom was drove up on camera. She said, well, I'll have to tell you one thing. And she looked at me and Ricky looked at my dad and said, turn the car around. They need to find another school. Ain't nobody going to school here. So that ended me going to trust. State, I think there were too many naked people laying right on the campus. So the following week, my dad put myself and Ricky Young. I had a cousin that was had played at Jackson State, and he had told Bob Hill that he had a couple of guys for to come up. So we went over to visit Bob that Saturday. Bob wasn't interested in Robert Brazil. He was interested in Ricky Young. He said, oh, he looked down at Ricky Lake and said, you play full back, you say, yeah. And they had a good conversation. He said, well, I got Walter and Eddie. I need a good full back. He signed Ricky. And I asked him, I said, what about me, coach? He said, well, you come on. You, you're in pretty good company. So that's how I ended up at Jackson State. What was it like playing football at Jackson State in the early 70s? It was a challenge. And I think if you look at what we did and what we had to go through during the 70s, the sweat was what we call the SEC right now. You had a bunch of great athletes from both Grammar, Texas Southern, Prairie View, all corn, Mississippi Valley. We had some great athletes. I mean, I think some of the people that I played with, uh, I think after my senior team, we had eight guys to go to the pros. So, and before that, we had four or five. And the year before that, we had two or three. So, you're talking about a Challenging day every day when it comes to talent on the field. I can't think of a school that's not a big time school that can have three Hall of Famers playing with them at the same time. You had you, or three should be Hall of Famers, and you, Walter Payton, and Jackie Slater there. Oh yes, oh yeah. You got other guys also there. You had uh, Ricky Young with played with the Vikings, uh, Charles James with the Jets, and John Tate, Roscoe Wood. Uh, Jerome Barkham, all these guys, we weren't all there at the same time, but we did come through the same program, shall I say. So we didn't get the recognition. And uh, when you're thinking when you, what you was just saying, you know, Walter and myself, you had two first rounds to come out of, a, out of one class and out of one, out of one dormitory room. That said a lot for a college. Were you roommates with Walter at Jackson State? Yeah, we roomed a little bit on the road and as well as uh, in on campus. On the, we had three to a room, so I had three roommates. <laughs> was he a prankster back in college like he was in the pros? He was more of a prankster. Walter was Walter. Walter hadn't changed. <laughs> Walter <laughs> would do things that we knew he was going to do and still get away with it. But we loved him just the same. But you know what? Walter talked a lot, but nowhere near like his brother Eddie does. Eddie did and still does. Eddie, I think, talks more trash than anybody. Well, well, Walter was the one that did all his talking with his ability. Eddie did a lot of his talking and his disability off the field. But Walter, you got to have a spokesman in that group. And I think at Jackson, we had about five or six good spokesmen that Eddie gets a trophy for the number one spokesman. The Jackson State. Did you have any idea that Walter was going to become the great player he was when you saw him in college? Well, I had played against some great athletes coming out of Mobile. 
and I played against some great running backs uh, during my college career. Walter was an exceptional, different type of athlete. Walter could do anything he wanted to with a football, with a basketball, any kind of thing, any with a ball, Walter could do it. I saw this guy grow up and mature. A, a lot of people want um, to ask me all the time, what made you such a great pursuer or a great tackler? I said, if I could just get my hands on Walter, I thought I was great, making a great tackle. Just to get my hands, I ain't talking about getting it down, just to touch him. And when you practice against a guy like Walter every day, it betters your game and it betters your program. You mentioned the 75 draft. You were drafted number six. Walter was drafted number four. Did you have any idea the Oilers were going to take you? No. Uh, I think Gia Brett and, um, and the Dallas Cowboys, that's who I thought I was going to get drafted by. Uh, but that just fizzled out. But I had no idea. All I wanted to do was to, just to hit the pros, just to prove my ability when I got there, just to get drafted by a team. We all, I think Ricky Walter had some great ambitions of the team that they were picking. Ricky always wanted to go to the West Coast. Walter just wanted to play. I think he wanted to be a bat. But rather than, I didn't have a choice. I just wanted to go play professional football. Did you play in the college all-star game that uh, year in Chicago? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. That was one of the last college all-star games. What was that like? Well, it was, it was, it was, it was quite an experience. I mean, uh, when you turn the Super Bowl champ and you line up against these champs, and we were so, we had such a good senior class. If you think about those 75 class that we put out on the field against the Steelers, we, we just thought, hey, this is our chance to shine. Uh, we went up on the Steelers to uh, Joe Gilliam came in and said, what are you guys trying to do? He, he talked to us about that game because it, with his ability, I mean, he threw a couple of touchdowns in the second half to, to, for them to win the game. But I really thought we was going to beat them. And it was a great experience for me. I was ready for training camp when I got there. I know what to, to suspect there. Your first coach... <clears throat> was Bum Phillips. Bum was putting that team together. What was Bum like? Bum was a one of the coaches that I think should be, again, in the Hall of Fame. Bum, to me, was one of the best coaches to play under. I had been up under some coaches that I admired and respected. My high, my high school coaches was great coaches. My college coach was a Real sergeant of Coach Bob here worked us to death. Matter of fact, I said when I got to the pro, I was thinking, um, this all we gonna do after a couple of days. But when I got a chance to build and no bomb, you got to understand Bob was the type of person that he earned his respect through you and you earned your respect through Bomb in a total father like situation. I mean, you can go to Bomb and tell, ask him anything, and he will give you a truthful answer, and it's probably the answer you want to hear. I mean, Bomb, I, I need to go home. I, we're having uh, Father's Day in Mobile on, in, in June. I'm probably going to be back for the – can you be back the next day? Yes, but go see your folks. I mean, he was so understanding. He was one of the most lovable and understanding coach that a professional was. Would 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 ever born play up under? He played that three four defense, which utilized your size and speed. And people think of Lawrence Taylor is the prototypical outside linebacker, but you basically invented that position. Well, I think it was a couple of guys. The ball knew what he wanted when he put that three four defense together. You have to understand. On the side of me was an all a Hall of Famer named Evan Bethay, and next to him was. Taylor Cup, which is a Hall of Famer. And on the other side, we had Andy Doors. And a lot of people forget about my strong side linebacker, Teddy Washington. Teddy Washington was one of the strongest strong side linebackers that I ever seen play the game. Not taking nothing away from no one else in, no one else in the NFL. And Teddy Washington was a great. And they had nowhere to run. I mean, then we got Teddy holding up everything on that side. You got Evan and and Robert Reveal on the right side most of the time coming at you. 
it's hard to pursue that, and it fit what we had. Bon was he, he he drafted the people that he needed for that three four defense. Curry was the best nose guard. You got Evans and Robin on the same side. Greg Dinger and Steve Kiner and linebacker and Teddy Washington. That was one great three four defense. It just seemed like during that time. The Oilers were in the Cowboys' shadow. I mean, the Cowboys were Tom Landry with that fedora. You had Bum basically with his 8-gallon, 12-gallon. I don't know how many gallons you could put in that hat. And again, everybody said America's team, America's team. But you guys were extremely, like you said, talented there. And I think you could hold your own with that Cowboy team. Well, I think it started before I got there. You got to understand the Oilers organization hadn't had a winning season. I mean, they probably hadn't won five or six games in, what, two or three years. Then Baum come in, and the Seal Gibbons put together a great group of guys, a great group of guys. I mean, they traded with that Matuze trade for Curly, Teddy. Uh, you got uh, some people that we traded, like myself, coming in for a number one draft choice, and we built what we needed. But we still was under the shadows of a winning organization, which was the Cowboys. The Cowboys had took all our fans out of Houston because they were winning and they was America's team. We had to build a respect by winning on the field, on the field. And that's what we tried to do. We were, we knew if we could win games, we'd get our fans back. You found instant success. You were rookie of the year, your first year. Was it that easy for you playing in the pros? No, I think it was a being in the right situation with the right defensive call that got me look of the year. Uh, I was learning. I had two all pros and three all pros and one hell of a defensive coordinator with Eddie Viles, and they utilized what I could do for that defense. I could wreck, I could pass coverage. I could do just what they needed from the weird position. And I had originally been a middle linebacker, so I had a great sense of, you know, leadership from, from Jackson. And it just carried on over into the pro. I fell in with the guys that I needed to fall in with, and we played as a team, as one big unit. And that's what made us so successful. It wasn't just Robert. I had some talent. But we had a unit that played together. We talked about Walter Payton. He could run. He could catch. He could do it all. He was so hard to bring down. Earl Campbell, I remember those battles with the Bears and Oilers. I mean, Walter was a great all-around player, but I think pure running, there was no one stronger than Earl Campbell at that time. Again, I, 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 I tell people, you know, because me and Earl spent some time on the road as roommates, I used to tell people this, and it's kind of a fun little joke I use all the time. I said, I said, with the best two running backs in the NFL, Earl Campbell in the pros and Walter Payton in college, both in was my roommate at the same time. But we all slept in different beds. I always, I always tell people, I didn't sleep with him. I slept in a different bed in the same room with him. So it's kind of a joke. Earl, Earl was Earl Cameron. Uh, Earl would run over you, run through you, around you. He was faster than he uh, ever. People would think Earl was in the past as he would. But if he ever came to shoot, I think people just didn't want to catch up with him and try to haul him down. But as far as him being... Raiders number one, two good, two good, two good backs. Walter on one hand, Earl on the other hand, both great running backs. Should be and they are great Hall of Famers. And I, I mean, I mean, I was lucky again. When you leave the pros with a Walter, then you come to. I mean, you leave college with a guy named Walter, then you come to the pro with a girl with a, with a guy named Earl Cameron, and you practicing against these guys every day. You, you got to better your game. Oh, you can better that game. You know, talent bring about more talent. And the more you challenge your talent, the better you get. Jack Camp says he remembers playing that championship game against you. They were beating you guys, and there was like a minute left in the game. Jack said, I just wanted to get the game over with to go to the Super Bowl. And there's Earl Campbell coming, just busting through the hole. He broke my home. And I look at Earl. I go, Earl, what are you doing? He goes, I don't give up till the end. That's true. That's the type of ball play he was. We played 60 minutes. I mean, we played 61 minutes. That's how we hit the football field. And that, that's the type of attitude that all of us have. Whatever it took. We, had, we just were a type of group of guys that just did not 
want to say if I could have, would have, should have after the game. We wanted to win every game. We had a purpose. I know we, you know, we like the all would never be another all the team like that, but we really gave it our best on the field. I'm real proud of my career and the guys that I played with because I really thought if I had to go to war, I would have to go to war with these guys again. What team gave you the hardest problem? I think I have the hardest problem uh, uh, was the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Houston Oilers. I say this because I was challenged. We needed to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers to get to where we wanted to be, which was the Super Bowl. Um, I think we had a great shot. The referees made a bad call, but after I, um, I, 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 you know, I'm out of the game and I regret this, and I probably would take it to my grave. I did not get my defense ready after that bad call. Sure, we that was a bad call, but we still had to play defense. And I feel so bad today. Every time I think about that, I could not get my guys back together to play the defense we need to win to go to the Super Bowl. You got to get over the adversity. You got to get over the bad call. You still got to play the rest of the game. And we never recover after that. And I feel I feel I take some personal blame about that because we did not overcome it. How has the game changed from when you played to how it's played now? Well, if you look at my Hall of Fame wall, well, most of my licks are illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I got a 50, I got a, uh, a, what they call a hit clothesline on Billy Kibber. I got a helmet up under the chin, a DDT on Roger Starback. Uh, it's just all illegal licks. I mean, I would, I know I'm basically call me Mr. Versatile, and I could have, I would have changed my game if I had to play today. But it's, I think it's not as physical defensively like it was when we played. How hard was it when your wife got in a car accident to go on? Well, actually, I didn't go no further. I retired. I actually retired. I had, uh, I, I left the decision up to uh, my son, and, uh, which was eight at the time, and I went to training camp, and uh, <coughs> right before I went to training camp, it was in the back of my mind uh, to leave. And uh, I remember saying, Daddy's got to go to training camp. He said, well, Daddy, you done made enough money. Let's go to Mobile. Let's go down to Granite. I want to go live with Granite. This is my mom living in Mobile. And I just took that to training camp. I think the all of made it easy for me by releasing me. But uh, I knew then I wanted to. Come in the league as an all and leave, leave as an all. So it was it was kind of rough, but bittersweet for me. Again, I give you credit, though. I mean, you went on with your life, and you've been involved coaching and helping special needs kids. How how hard is it to basically get people to understand that kids with special needs are kids, too, and a lot of people just take them for granted? I think uh, when you say the word kid, if you don't have to have special needs. When you say the word kid, they need special attention. We as, um, now that I see even my own children uh, adjusting and doing things, and I'm saying, I think if we need to get away from the electronics a little bit and put our arm around these kids, because I, I, I was a blessed kid with my mom and dad, even up to the day they had both living. And I saw the love they put in with me. And I just wanted to just do something for kids that, because I wasn't the smartest kid. I was a, a hustler. Uh, I could get my work, but it was still something there that I needed, and that was love. And I got it a lot from my teachers, and I respected my teachers. So that was one of the things I wanted to do after I got out of football was to go back and give back to my community. I was probably one of the less paid people in the mobile public school system, but they couldn't pay me the joy and the love that I had for the kids from my daily basis. And I could touch a kid or if I could help a kid or do anything to make his day a little better, that made Rob Brazil feel like he was a millionaire. And that's what I was doing. You're right, because, I mean, I've done a lot of things with special needs with the Knights of Columbus and other charities, and it's just working with them and seeing how dedicated they are and how much 
love they have to give is incredible. I mean, when you go to a grocery store and see a bag and they take pride in their work, whereas an average person doesn't care. But everything they do, they take pride in and they want to do their best with. You're so right. You're so right. I mean, um, you see a kid get one of, when I say one of my kids, I don't like to even use the word special. I'm going to say one of our big kids. These kids, they try harder. They want to be on time. They run in the class. They are so happy for it. I mean, if you, if you, if you now I feel like I couldn't miss a day because I would be letting one of them down. And then my, my, my time from the school, it was very hard for the NFL or uh, anyone to keep me from going to school every day. I mean, I probably made a lot of people mad because I wouldn't show up for this. I wouldn't do that. But I had a purpose. I had made a, 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 a personal thing to do that for those kids every day. And that's why I just vanished and went to my, work, my, my place of work every day. And another thing I noticed is when I go to church, when they're at church, they watch out for each other. And basically they make sure if one of them needs help, they help each other. If one of them's getting out of line, they get they, the, the, they each get, other in line. They get they get people with a slow start. Uh, that's the best way to sum it up. <laughs> exactly. So, why are you not in the Hall of Fame? I honestly don't know. Uh, uh, I've, I've, I've said this over and over again. You know, Robbins and I, a number one draft pick in the first round. The good Lord saw that Robbins did need to be picked six. And he went to the UC Marvel and had a great career. Why I'm not in the Hall of Fame? There's so many guys. And if you look back, it's not just Rob Brazil that needs to be in the Hall of Fame. It's a lot of guys that need to be in the Hall of Fame. We're in the good law. And the NFL committee finds time to consider what I've done to the league. If it's not enough, I'm satisfied. I left it all on the field. And if I get a chance to make it to the Hall of Fame, Oh, uh, man, it would be one hell of a Super Bowl for me. It would be my Super Bowl because there's no more Oilers. But I can't answer that question why I'm not there. I would, I'd love to be there, but I don't know why. What I don't get is the Dallas Cowboys started out as the Dallas Texans. When the Oilers left and went to Tennessee, they became the Titans. Then Houston gets a team back, and they take the Cowboys' original name. Why doesn't Houston talk to the Texans and say, give us that Oiler name back? Because, again, Houston deserves the Oilers, not the Texans. I, I, you're so true. Um, again, I think it's, you know, it's, it's just, that's Texas. That's just Texas. I'm the owner, Mr. Adams. You got Brett, you know, this is so where he is right now. Um, I think they should have did exactly what everybody thought. If they went to to Tennessee, they still should have left the name, or t- taken that name with them. You see Oakland go to L.A. to still with the Raiders. I mean, uh, and now all these other changes. I never know. I try to stay out of marriage because marriage, the only thing I want from marriage was the respect in my paycheck. <laughs> exactly. With the price of oil down, I think the oil name went down in price too. Yeah, well, you know, we're an extinct animal. I mean, once this group of all has passed away, there will never be another all. <laughs> You're right. Unless somebody but, come up with, you know, the sad so, to say that and it's scary, but, you know, we're getting down in numbers. Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure talking to you. Hey, guy, I mean, uh, I know you did a lot of stuff with Walter, and I appreciate everything else I could do for Rob Brazil. But, uh, I gave it my all. If it's time for Robert, uh, whenever it's time for Robert to to go further, I will go. But I'm happy. Uh, my family's all doing well. My mom and dad is living. I can, I just, you know, when you can sing in the mail, of course, with your dad and enjoy him and go over there and still eat some of the mother's bread pudding, that's a hell of a feeling for a guy my age. And I am so blessed to have them both here. If I make it to the Hall of Fame, we got a secret. We got a, we got a message for them and all the others because I will be taking them with me. And Bob has always been a part of me and my teammates have always and will be always a part of my life. We all like brothers and we all get to try to get together every now and then. So 
Thank you for considering me with this um this interview. I hope I was okay with you, but uh, I'm still Rob Vazir. I'm not Dr. Doom. <laughs>